Welcome to Data Management with Python and SQL Alchemy. My name is Christopher, and I will be your guide. This course is all about interacting with databases in Python through the third-party library, SQL Alchemy. In this course, you'll learn about SQL, also known as SQL, the language used to interact with most relational databases, and then dive into SQL Alchemy, a library for using SQL concepts in Python. SQL Alchemy breaks down into two parts. Core, which allows you to write SQL statements directly, or use functions to do the same. And the second part, the ORM, an object relational mapping implementation that lets you treat rows in a database as objects. The code in this course was tested using Python 3.10, SQL Alchemy 1.4.36, and SQL Lite 3.37. SQL Alchemy is undergoing revisions heading to a new way of doing things in its 2.0 form, which at the time of recording was still in beta. Luckily, 1.4 is pretty close to the 2.0 concepts, so you're future-proofed, but you definitely don't want to be following along with 1.3 or earlier, there are some big differences. What is software besides a set of rules for manipulating data? And oftentimes, you want that data to persist between execution of your program or to be passed between programs. You may have used a text file, also known as a flat file data representation, for storing data. These can be useful, but often have limitations. A database provides a more robust way of representing data objects and their interrelations. There are actually different kinds of databases, but the most common is what is called a relational database. If someone just says database to you, they probably mean the relational kind. Most relational databases support the structured query language, or a dialect of it, for managing the contents of that database. SQLite is a popular, self-contained, single-file database engine. One of the beauties of it, especially if you're just learning databases, is that it doesn't require a server. It has all the power of a database, except it's local to your file system. And seeing as you're here at Real Python, the question probably is, great, but how do I use it with Python? Yep, well, there are actually many libraries that can help you interact with databases. I'll be covering SQL Alchemy, a third-party library with several different styles of interaction. Next up, I'll introduce you to data storage through the use of CSV files. Gotta walk before you can run. In the previous lesson, I gave an overview of the course. In this lesson, I'll talk about CSV files as an example of flat file storage. Your software stores data in memory through the use of variables, but like life, this is fleeting. Exit the program or turn off your computer and the memory is gone. This can be addressed through saving things out to some sort of storage, usually your disk drive. A side benefit of this is, if it's done well, it can be used to interact with more data than can be held in memory at any one time. Flat file storage is a generic term for text-based files that typically can be read by a person. There are many different formats. Some common ones are CSV, the one which I'll be using shortly, JSON, and the granddaddy of angle brackets, XML. Let's go look at a program that uses Python's CSV module to see the kinds of things that can be done with a flat file format. And here it is, 14 lines of data. This is a listing of books. CSV stands for comma separated values. And looking at this data, you can probably see where it gets its name. It's a list of values separated by commas. Clever, huh? A lot of CSV files have a header line by convention. The header line gives the name of each column of data. I've highlighted it here. After the header row, each row here is a book with the author's first and last names, followed by the book's title and then the name of the publisher. In the case of special characters, for example, wanting to have a comma, you typically surround the value in quotes. CSV is a loosely defined thing. You will run into variations on how to use it. But the format here is what Excel uses, and being one of the most popular programs on the planet weighs pretty heavily. Here is some code that reads in that same CSV file and prints out some summary information. It does this through the use of the CSV module. 
in particular the dict reader class. The dict reader takes a file which it expects to have a header row and then allows you to iterate over that using a reader. The reader will contain a series of dictionaries. The keys in each dictionary are the column header name, while the value is the corresponding value from the row. I'm using a default dict here to store some summary information. The default dict is created with an integer, which means you can assume that a key exists, and if it didn't, the default dict will create one automatically for you in the form of an int. I loop through each row of data, adding the author's name and publisher's name into the respective dictionaries to form a count of occurrences. After that, I print out a summary of how many instances of each author name and of each publisher. Let's go run this. There you go, a count for each author and a count for each publisher. CSV has some limitations. For example, data is repeated. There are four books by Stephen King and each get a row. That means Stephen's name shows up four separate times. This is because everything is from the row's perspective, which in this case is the book. If I want to add the age of an author, technically I can do it, but I'd have to store it on each of the four instances of King's books. If I need to make a change, I'd have to do that in all four places. Essentially, any data associated with the book is just that. It's an attribute of the book. I can't really interrelate different items easily. For example, Richard Buckman is an alias of Stephen King's. Or detecting it has one author but two publishers. It's messy. To detect any of these things, you'd have to write some custom code. You probably know where this is leading. Relational databases to the rescue. They solve all these problems. Next up, I'll show you how. In the previous lesson, I covered flat file storage. In this lesson, I'll introduce you to databases and SQL. A relational database gets its name from the fact that it stores the relationships between things. It does this through treating data as a series of tuples. This is kind of like the row in the CSV file you saw in the last lesson, except a row can contain references to another row or in another table altogether. The relationships are identified through the use of keys. There are two main types. Primary keys are a unique identifier for a tuple. These are usually integers and typically are auto-incremented by the database engine so you don't have to think about it. The second kind of key is a foreign key. Foreign in this case meaning from another table. This would be the primary key for another object. A tuple containing a foreign key is indicating a relationship with the tuple for which the value is its primary key. Consider the following example. This is a table with authors. PK is short for primary key. Each row in our table is a tuple of the primary key, first name, and last name. I can add a different table of books. Same idea. Each tuple has a primary key, but this time it also has a foreign key pointing to the author table. It and dead zone are by author number one, the king of horror, Stephen. A foreign key doesn't have to be to a different table. In fact, it can be to another row in the same table. This new column allows me to indicate that Stephen and Richard are the same person. This isn't actually a very good design, as it means an author can only have one alias, but it makes my point about foreign keys being able to be on the same table. In a future lesson, I'll address how you would do this properly. As far as I know, every relational database out there supports some dialect of the structured query language, or SQL to its friends. This language is a little different from what you might be used to in coding. It's what's known as a declarative language. That means you write the final state of what you want and the computer makes it so. You're describing what you want rather than how to get it. There's a core set of concepts to SQL that pretty much get implemented by all databases. And then many databases add to the language features that only work with them. This is what is known in the industry as vendor lock-in. For the most part, I'll be sticking to the generic stuff in this course. 
The beauty of SQL is you don't have to think about the underlying format. The database engine is responsible for that. You can say, create a table, and the database makes you a table. In this course, I'll be using SQLite as my database engine. This is a small, single file, self-contained engine which doesn't require a server. According to its website, it is the most used engine in the world, and whether or not you know it, you're probably using it. It gets embedded in applications all the time, and there's a good chance it's on your phone right now. SQLite comes with a command line tool that works like a Python REPL, allowing you to interact directly with your database. I'll be starting with that before moving on to SQL Alchemy in a future lesson. Your operating system may or may not come with SQLite. You can grab either the source code or a binary at the link here if you're planning to follow along and it doesn't come by default in whatever you're using. The command line tool that I mentioned for SQLite is called SQLite 3. When you run it, you give it the name of the file that it will be using as its storage mechanism. Once inside, you get prompted. There are two kinds of things you can do here. You can run dot commands or enter SQL directly. The dot commands are built-in utilities provided by SQLite, whereas the SQL will be the language you use to do things in the database. And there is your first SQL lesson. The comment symbol in SQL is two dashes. Let's create a table for our authors. The create command takes two arguments, what to create, a table in this case, and what to call it, author. The parenthesis is then used to give the command parameters. When creating a table, the parameters are the columns in the table. My first column is the primary key, which I'm calling author ID. It is an integer, which can't be empty. And as I said, it's the primary key. The second column is the author's first name. There are several ways of storing text in a database. Remember when I mentioned SQL dialects? Well, here's your first gotcha. SQLite doesn't care about string length. No matter what kind of text declaration you use or how much space you specify, you'll get the same underlying thing. On other database systems, you may have to specify how big this field is. Here, I'm being lazy, knowing that it's SQLite and it doesn't care. The third column is the last name, and then a closing parenthesis and a semicolon to say that I'm done. The table has been created. Doesn't tell you so, but you can ask. Dot tables is a SQLite command that lists the tables in the database. So far, I've only created one. There it is, named author. With a table in place, let's do something with it. Select is probably the most used SQL command, and its purpose is to select some data out of some tables. The star here indicates that I want all of the columns from the table, and everything to the right of the from is what table to look for data in. Why didn't it do anything? Well, there's no data in the author table, so there's nothing to select. Let's fix that. Insert puts data into a table. Here, I've inserted into the author table. The contents of the first parentheses are the columns in the author table being populated. I'm specifying all of them, not counting the primary key, which is automatic. But if your table has a column that allows empty values or has a default, you don't necessarily have to specify it. The content to the right of the values keyword matches the tuples specifying the column names. So Isaac is the first name and Asimov the last name. No response from this SQL statement. That's good. It means it works. Let me just insert one more. And now I've got two authors. I'll rerun the select. And there's the results. The pipe character here separates the columns in the answer. 
Isaac has primary key one, while Pearl has primary key two. The data doesn't usually line up like this. It's just a coincidence that Isaac and Pearl have the same number of letters. Let's insert someone else. And selecting again. See what I mean about the data not lining up? Oh, oops, it isn't Tim, it's Tom. Let's do something about that. The update statement allows you to change a row. The set part says what fields to change, while the where clause indicates those rows that should be changed. I'm being very specific here by using a primary key in the query. An update can apply to multiple rows by having a more generic where clause. I could do something like where author ID is greater than one, and then both Pearl and Tim would become Tom. And the update worked. Tom it is. Let's try something more specific than select star. That's all the first names. This gives you a fair amount of flexibility. The output doesn't have to be in the same order as the table columns. Let me put Tim back in there. There he is. And now I'll fix it. The delete statement allows you to remove some data. Like with the update, the where clause specifies what rows are acted upon, which means both Tom and Tim are gone. Authors alone are boring. Let's add some books. Up until now, I've been sticking to the SQL convention of using all caps. SQL doesn't actually care. I'm lazy and a Python developer, so I probably won't keep doing that. The colorization here is a feature of the tool I'm using to record this, not part of SQLite. So you might want to stick with capitals to make it easier to read. The highlighting here helps identify the keywords without having to get a cramp from holding the shift key. Using dot tables, shows that I now have both author and book tables. Note the foreign key in the book table specified by using the references keyword. Author ID integer references author says that the book table contains a foreign key to the table author. Now I'll add a book. And there it is. The first one is the primary key of the book. The second one is the foreign key to the author. I had to set it to Asimov's primary key. This establishes the relationship between this book row and the Asimov row in the author table. This would be the relational part of the relational database. I'll add another book. And there they are. Now let's do something fancier. I'll be selecting from multiple tables. This is called a join. When you select multiple tables, you can alias the table. This line uses A as an alias for the author table. You'll see in a second where that gets declared. The double pipe symbol is a text join. So the first column of the results of the select will be the author's first name, then a space, then the author's last name. The as statement here creates a name for this column. I'm still choosing what to output at this point. This is the second column, which will be the title of the book. 
Now I'm telling select where to get the A info. That's the author table. And to join that with the book table, known as B in the query. The on clause specifies how to correlate the data between the tables participating in the join. In this case, I'm saying to find all the books and match their author IDs with all the authors. The end result is some data in tabular format with the author's name in the first column and their book in the second column. Think back to the CSV file in the previous lesson. Ignoring the publisher part, you now have enough knowledge to create a select statement with a join that could produce the data you found in the CSV. That's enough for now. To leave the SQLite command line tool, you can press Control D. You've had a whirlwind intro to SQL. Next up, I'll add some Python to your Python course and use SQL Alchemy to do some SQL in your Python code. In the previous lesson, I introduced you to writing SQL to manipulate a relational database. In this lesson, I'll show you how to use SQL Alchemy to accomplish the same things in your Python code. SQL Alchemy is a popular third-party library for accessing and managing databases. It is made up of two parts, core and the ORM. The core is a Python abstraction of SQL, where the ORM uses object-oriented modeling to represent database rows. One of the advantages of using a library like SQL Alchemy is it abstracts away the connection mechanisms. You initialize the SQL Alchemy engine the same way regardless of what kind of database you're connecting to. This means you can use any number of the supported databases in the same fashion. This includes SQLite, Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, and many more. Let's go into the REPL and turn some lead into gold. The first thing you have to do is connect to your database. SQL Alchemy does this through an abstraction called an engine. Let me import in the engine's factory. And now I'll create an engine. The URL style parameter here indicates what I'm connecting to. Instead of HTTP, you specify the type of database. For me, that's SQLite. The path part indicates where the database is. For a database that used a server, this would have a host name and a port. Because SQLite uses files, this is a file reference. I'm connecting to the books.db file in the data subdirectory. The engine factory uses lazy loading, so the connection hasn't been established yet. The echo parameter turns on SQL echoing. Everything I do through this connection will print out the SQL equivalent. It'll be a bit noisy, but for our purposes, you'll be able to see exactly what is going on. I mentioned in the first lesson that SQL Alchemy is going through an adaptation phase heading for the 2.0 release. The 1.4 version supports both the old dialect and the new dialect of SQL Alchemy. The future equals true argument here says to enforce the use of the new mechanism. That way, when 2.0 is released, your code will work with it with fewer changes. Let's use this engine to connect. Everything from here on will be done through my con object. Now, I'll write a query. For this lesson, I'll be solely using the text query object. This allows you to write raw SQL directly to the engine. There you go. The execute method on the connection object runs a query. The text object takes a string as an argument containing raw SQL, and in this case, I'm running a select statement. The method returns a result object. The muted logger info here is because I initialized the engine with echo equals true. You can see that it created a transaction, that's the begin, then did a select. The database was able to run the query in 0 0.00024 seconds. Pretty snappy. Let's look at the results. 
Result.all returns a list of tuples, and the database I'm using was populated with two authors in the previous lesson, good old Isaac and Pearl. All right, let's make some changes now. To do an insert, I'll need to execute a query. Like before, I'm using a text object so I can put in raw SQL. There's something new here though. Notice that in the values clause of the insert, I'm using colon fn and colon ln. The colon indicates that these are placeholder values. SQL Alchemy sees these and knows to populate them with the parameters that you passed to text. This next line is those parameters. I'm passing in a list of dictionaries, where each dictionary has an FN and LN key. These get mapped to the FN and LN placeholders in the query. By passing in a list of dictionaries, I am able to insert more than one author at a time. Let me just close the call. And you see a few things. First off, you get the insert debug info showing Tom and Steven, I speak as if they're close friends, being inserted. Next, because I didn't capture the result of the execute, the REPL shows a result object. If I were writing real code, I'd check to make sure nothing went wrong here. Let's query for our authors again. And there you go. There are now four authors in the database. Remember that begin statement several queries ago? I'm still inside of the same transaction. These all get grouped together as part of the database. Calling commit closes the transaction off and makes all the changes permanent. So what are transactions good for? Well, if you get partway through a group of queries, you can undo all of them by rolling back the transaction. To demonstrate that, I'll start by inserting another author. Same as you've seen before. And now there's not an author cluttering up my data. Calling rollback instead of commit. And everything has been undone to the point of the last commit. I can show that by running the query again. And not an author is gone. Handy that you can undo. Let's play with some query results some more. Same select as before. But this time, instead of calling dot all, I'll iterate over the result object. Each item in the result object iterator corresponds to a row in the database, or it does this time because that was the kind of select I did. I can access the columns in a result by using the columns names, row.lastname and row.firstname, for example. Note that the result object is temporal. Accessing the items in it consumes them. That's why colon.all now shows an empty list. This might take a little getting used to, but it's actually a good thing because it means you can iterate partway through a result, do something in your code, and then go back and not have to remember where you were. This becomes particularly important when you start to get into things like pagination and larger sets of data. Although I like to think of the results of a SQL query as being a row in the database, this is a faulty mental abstraction. 
Oftentimes, that is exactly what you're getting back, but really you're creating a data set with specific names. If you use a join, you'll end up with parts of data from different tables. Here, I'd been specific about the fields I was interested in, so when I iterate through the results, I can treat the columns coming back as parts of a tuple. One more time. I can also use indexes into those same tuples to get at their values. Okay, one more, one more time. The mappings method on the result object returns the rows as dictionaries instead of tuples. This can be useful if you wanted a dictionary format anyhow. For example, if you were going to serialize this data to JSON. Just like with the insert statement, you can parameterize a select statement. Here, the WHERE clause is saying that I'm looking for authors whose last name is greater than capital C. Because I used a parameter to define this, I could actually have passed in the dictionary ln colon capital C at runtime. There's the result of the query. Don't forget that this is doing string comparison. Something that starts with capital C, like Clancy, and is bigger than a single letter, like Clancy, is actually greater than just capital C. Capital C. Capital C. Now I've got a Nine Inch Nails song going through my head. Anyhow. Since you specify the parameters to a statement as part of the execute method, that means you can pre-prepare a statement and reuse it. Here, I've kept the text object in a variable called statement. This is what it looks like. Not particularly helpful but I can take this statement and bind parameters to it. Now I can execute. And you can see that this was just another way of getting to the same place. But now I can reuse that statement and bind new parameters. Capital B it is. I used to stand for something. Trent Reznor's an angry, angry dude. What was I saying? All done here. So, like a good boy, I'll clean up my connections by calling close. I have a very important warning about writing raw SQL. You might be tempted to think, hey, this is all text. I can just concatenate or use F strings. And that would be a very bad idea. Doing it this way leaves you open to what's called an SQL injection attack. A clever person might pass you a last name that would break your code or worse, do malicious things. You may have noticed that all the SQL calls have ended with a semicolon. If I pass in a last name here that has a semicolon and then say a delete statement, you'd be running both your insert and my delete. And that's probably not what you want. Parameters solve this problem. They properly escape anything you pass in. So you should always use parameters. SQL injection has been around for a long time. I remember finding a vulnerability in a forms product in 1996. You'd think us coders would learn, but no, the wrong way is still pretty common. The OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities list dropped SQL injection to spot three in 2021, which is down from spot one in previous years. 
I'm not sure whether that's because the coding community is finally waking up to these kinds of exploits or whether it's just that spots one and two actually just surpassed it. Parameters only, no dynamic strings. Got it? Good. And if you want to laugh on this, go look up XKCD and Little Bobby Tables to see an example. SQL's core has two ways of doing queries. You've seen the direct use of SQL through the text object. Next up, you'll see the functions and objects that abstract this away. 